Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's Nano Talk. My name is Shua Luti and I will be hosting the Nano Talks this evening. As um, so many of events in the past months, uh, the Nano Talks are of course also affected by, by COVID and we're not doing them the way we're used to, to having them. Before 2020, Nano Talks typically meant uh, an evening uh, in some lecture ro uh, room at the University of Zurich with all of you in the audience, uh, me and some speakers standing in the front. Now it means uh, remote YouTube live streams. And today, as an extra precaution due to rising COVID numbers, we also made sure that none of the speakers would need to be in my place, but we're doing the Nano Talks fully remotely. But fear not, the Nano Talks will still be as interactive as ever, you will have a chance to ask our speaker, speakers questions. You will learn a lot about the Nobel Prizes for Physiology and Medicine and for Economics and be able to interact with us at the same time. And I'll go a bit more into details in how that works in the coming few minutes. But before I go into too much details about the nanotalks themselves, uh, let me tell you a bit about the organization uh, behind the nanotalks which is REACH. REACH is a think tank um, that is really working on establishing a science-friendly culture. I think in these times we see more and more why it's so important that scientists work side by side with society and with politicians um, and how important it is that we as scientists communicate clearly um, the things we found. REACH as a think tank is, do, is doing things in three main areas. Uh, the first of them is the area of training and uh, I'll talk a bit more about how we are training students and young researchers in a second. But we're also um, starting to do more policy work with our policy hub that has been uh, newly established this year. And we're publishing uh, results and written, uh, written essays on the REACH blog that you can find at REACH.ch. If you're interested uh, in knowing more about REACH uh, or in joining one of our over 200 members in Zurich, Bern, Basel or Lausanne, uh, then sign up uh, to the newsletter. You will find a link in the description of this video that will point you towards uh, a sign up form at the bottom of the page or you can just go to reach.ch and um, on via the contact form, join us as a member or contact me if you're interested in hearing more. <laughs> and now I also promised you, I would say a few words about training at REACH. Um, training at REACH happens under the umbrella of the SIMPAC program. And within the SIMPAC program, we want to train students and young researchers uh, in doing public outreach and science communication. For this purpose, we organize workshops, um, but we also have students hands-on uh, co-organizing those kind of events with us. For example, next month in the November Nano Talks, uh, it won't be me sitting here and moderating the talk, but it will be two young students who may be watching right now. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this impact program, go to simpact.reach.ch. And with that background out of the way, I promised you, you'd be able to interact with us uh, during this virtual talk. And for this, we're using a platform called Slido. Just go to slido.do and enter code nano minus oct, and you'll be able to post questions to any of the speakers during their talks or after their talks. The way this will run now is that we will first have the talk from Maya um, and then I will directly have the talk from Julian and then both speakers will join me via Zoom for a live Q&A uh, with you. You can post questions that come up during the talks or post them during our live Q&A. Uh, all of the details are also in the description of the video. So to the main content of the event and the reason you're here today, the actual nano talks. We'll have two talks tonight about Nobel Prizes. 
The first of them um, is given by Maya, who is a postdoc at the Institute of Virology. But before she was at the Institute of Virology, she was a postdoc in the Palkman's lab, where I'm also doing my PhD. So when I heard that the Nobel Prize was given out for something related to virus research, I immediately thought, huh, gotta ask Maya to tell me more about it and why the Nobel Prize was given out for this. And luckily, tonight, Maya is not just telling me, Maya is telling all of us. So Maya, the floor is all yours. Hello, and thank you, Jar, for having me here. I'm Maya Pietila, and I'm a postdoc at the Institute of Virology at the University of Zurich. Tonight, I will talk about the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine 2020 that was awarded for the discovery of hepatitis C virus. First, I would like to summarize the three main topics that are the liver, blood and viruses. And I hope that in next slides you will learn how these three are actually connected. Let's begin by defining what is hepatitis. It's an inflammation of the liver that can range from a short term to a lifelong disease. Often hepatitis is asymptomatic, but when symptoms appear, they include, for example, abdominal pain and fever. Unfortunately, hepatitis often causes a chronic state that can then lead to liver cirrhosis and then to liver cancer that can be fatal. Let's then think about what can cause hepatitis. Toxic substances like abuse of alcohol is one of the reasons. However, hepatitis viruses are the most common cause of hepatitis and at the same time they are also the most common cause of liver cirrhosis and cancer. And it has been approximated that these viruses cause about 1.4 million deaths per year. There are actually five different types of hepatitis viruses that are completely unrelated but cause the same disease. Hepatitis A and E, or those infections, usually come from contaminated food or water, while these three hepatitis viruses are blood-borne pathogens. Hepatitis A and E they don't usually cause a chronic disease, and there are also vaccines against these two hepatitis viruses. So actually, these blood-borne pathogens are a bigger concern. So let's focus on those. Hepatitis D can infect only persons who already have hepatitis B. So let's exclude that one as well for now. And now we are left with two hepatitis viruses. Good news are that there is also a vaccine against hepatitis B. The first one was developed already in 1969 by Baruch Bloomberg, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1976. And this discovery, or discovery of hepatitis B virus, then made it possible to develop blood tests to screen blood products for this virus and then to exclude positive blood donors. However, in the 70s, blood transfusions still remained very dangerous, even compared to Russian roulette, because there were so many cases of blood transfusion-related hepatitis. So there was still something going on that wasn't quite understood. And that was actually the driving force for the discovery of this hepatitis C virus. And this discovery was made by three scientists, Walter, Hutton and Rice, who were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 2020. 
and these scientists, they both discovered and characterized this new virus, this new hepatitis virus. And their pioneering work has made it possible that nowadays we have blood tests to identify both hepatitis B and C, and our blood products should be safe. Equally important, importantly, their work has also resulted in the development of very effective drugs that actually cure hepatitis C. Okay, so in next slides, I will walk you through the steps that solved this mystery of blood-borne hepatitis. So, in the 1970s, Huawei Alter was studying hepatitis patients and their blood samples. In one of his fundamental experiments, he took some blood or blood serum from these patients and then he injected that to chimpanzees. And, well, unfortunately, these chimpanzees then develop those same symptoms as these patients. So based on this, Alter could conclude that there must be another infectious agent that is causing hepatitis besides hepatitis B virus. However, it took one more decade before this unknown virus was actually identified. And that was done by Michael Hewton in the 1980s. He actually succeeded in the isolation of the virus genome, again, from infected chimpanzees. And based on that genetic code, this virus was now identified. And surprisingly, it wasn't related to those hepatitis viruses that were already known, but it belonged to the virus family called Flaviviridae. And these Flaviviruses, they, they also include many pathogens like yellow fever virus and dengue virus. And as at the time of this discovery or identification, hepatitis A and B were already known, this virus was named then as hepatitis C. Another major breakthrough at the 1980s was the first diagnostic test for hepatitis C virus. And that was developed together by Alter and Hewton. So finally, it was possible to identify all blood products that either contain hepatitis B or C and to make those blood products safe. However, there was still one, one piece of the puzzle missing, and that piece was provided by Charles Rice. Again, one, one more decade later, in the late 1990s, Charles Rice was able to engineer the whole hepatitis C virus genome in the test tube, and then he actually put only this viral genome into chimpanzees that once again developed the symptoms of hepatitis. So this was now the final proof that hepatitis C virus alone can cause hepatitis and it can also persist long, uh, long term and will raise this antibody defense. Okay, so what has then happened during the last 20 years? So all three scientists, Alter, Hewton and Rice, and also many other hepatitis C researchers, have been able to reveal many important mechanisms about how the virus actually replicates within the cell. And this info information has been really important when um, drugs have been both uh, designed and screened against hepatitis C virus. And all that work has resulted into this. So nowadays we have very effective 
and safe combination drugs that actually can cure hepatitis C virus infection in more than 95% of patients. So now we come, can come back to this one again. And although a vaccine is still unfortunately missing against hepatitis C virus, we do have very good blood tests to make safe blood products and we do have very effective antiviral drugs to cure hepatitis C. So, as a summary, the work done by Alter, Houghton and Rice, it has really saved and improved lives of millions of people. Okay, now when that's said, uh, it's also important to take a look to the current situation and to the future. So it is approximated that currently there are more than 300 million people worldwide who have either hepatitis B and or C infection. If we think about a group of 25 people, that would mean that one of them has hepatitis C or B. These two viruses also still remain the main cause of liver cancer and transplants. So why is that? Um, one of the main reasons is that diagnostics and treatment are not widely enough available. It has been approximated that only about 20% of all those people who have hepatitis C infection are actually aware of their infection. And this is mostly because those hepatitis C infections are often asymptomatic until the liver has been severely damaged. And then about this 20% Unfortunately, only about 15% are really treated. So that will result in those high, high numbers of deaths per year. And, and that's why hepatitis viruses still remain a major threat. And actually, the World Health Organization has set a goal to eliminate viral hepatitis by 2030. This goal, or in order to meet this goal by 2030, it includes many measures. One of the most important ones are childhood vaccinations. But at the same time, it's also really important to improve blood and injection safety, and also to improve diagnostics and treatment services, especially in, in low- and mid-income countries. Furthermore, different syringe and needle programs for injection drug users are important because among, among them, hepatitis is still, still a major issue. But if all these measures are done and the goal is, is achieved by 2030, that would mean that at least 7 million lives will be saved. Okay, so now we are again here where we started. And I hope that you have now learned how these three main topics, the liver, blood and viruses, are related. And I also hope that in the future, hepatitis viruses will be completely excluded from blood and from the liver. I hope you have enjoyed the talk and I would like to thank you for your attention and wish that you have a nice evening. Thanks a lot, Maya, for this really interesting um introduction and discussion of hepatitis C virus research and this overview over what happened in this research in the last uh, 40 years. 
Um, before we go to the next Nano Talk for tonight, I want to remind you that you have the opportunity to ask questions at sly.do um, by entering code nano minus oct. Um, any questions um, that came up during Maya's talk, uh, post them now before you forget them. Um, and then we'll go to the second talk for tonight. For our second talk, uh, Julian Teichgräber, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Economics at the University of Zurich, will tell us a bit more about what auctions are, why auctions are important, and why they were given the 2020 Nobel Prize in Economics. Julian, the floor is yours. I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Economics at the University of Zurich. And I would first like to thank the organizers for having me today because I think this is a great approach to science communication, which I really like. And so today I would like to tell you about the 2020 Nobel Prize in Economics, which was awarded to Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson, both from Stanford University, for their work on auctions. And I agree that auctions may appear like a bit of an abstract setting. So where have you seen auctions? And many of you think of some kind of online auction, maybe, because I'm sure most of you have bought something online on eBay or Ricardo or wherever, like this Rolex, which is up for sale and currently stands at 25,000 francs. But the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences says the Nobel Prize is uh, awarded for the improvements to auction theory and inventions of new auction formats. So did they really award the Nobel Prize just for, to help us to sell and buy stuff in online auctions, which are secondhand? And the answer is no, not really, because auctions are really everywhere. So today I want to tell you a bit about what we think about when we think of auction theory and that it really circles around the analysis of strategic behavior of bidders and then that auctions are really prevalent in many settings and we often don't even realize that we just participated in an auction and it really helps to make the economy more efficient. So let me tell you a bit about auction theory. Well, when you think of bidding on something, you might wonder how much is this object really worth? And let me lead you through this with an example. There are, there's a watch for sale. So I want to sell my watch right here. It's not a Rolex. It's not as, as much worth, but I still want to sell it. There are two bidders, A and B. And well, how much is it worth to them? They might think, well, we have what is called private values. A thinks it's 10 francs to me, worth to me. B thinks I'm, an, I'm a watch lover. This is 15 francs worth to me. But really those values could be independent and they just have independent tastes for watch. So this is a private component. But then the watch, can, watch value can also have a common value. So let's say the watch just has a collector's value, which is identical to both A and B. And both A and B form a guess about that value, which A says, okay, I think the collector's value is 10 francs, while B says, I think I'm optimistic. I think it's, it's 15 francs, but they all just think it for themselves. And so those are really important concepts for auction theory because bidders make strategic behavior and that may very much relies on how much they value that object. And Robert Wilson worked on this theory of common values and Paul Milgram incorporated a, a very comprehensive theory of both private and common values and made very general results on that. So they, they did some fancy math and uh, just showed uh, for various concepts of valuations uh, how different auctions work. So what kind of auction formats are out there? Well, the easiest one is probably the first price auction. We're still selling that watch here and uh, each bidder just submits one sealed bid. And the bidder with the highest bid wins and pays their bid. So if A says, I think it's 10 francs worth to me and B thinks, I think it's 15 francs uh, and 
A says, okay, then I bid eight francs and B bids 14 francs, then B actually wins the auction and pays her bid, which is 14 francs. So, but what if there was a common value to this watch, like the collector's value? What if it's actually only 12 francs worth, but B was just over optimistic about the value of the watch? What happens is that B paid too much and this is called the winner's curse because B paid 14, although the watch is only worth 14 because she was too optimistic. And then she's actually worse off by bidding and winning the auction compared to not participating in the auction at all. And this is a really important issue because this leads bidders who anticipate this to just bid much more defensively. And that in turn will reduce the revenue for the seller. So this winner's curse is especially prevalent in the first price auction, but it also appears in the so-called second price auction. In the second price auction, each bidder submits one sealed bid again, and the bidder with the highest bid wins and pays the second highest bid. So here, if B says, I bid 15 francs, A says, I bid 10 francs, then B wins and has to pay the bid of A, which is 10 francs. And again here, if the common value was 12 francs, well then there's no winner's curse because B paid only 10. So this winner's curse is already less likely to happen in the second price auction, but it's it can still happen. And now Milgram uh, actually showed that there's an even better auction format to mitigate this winner's curse, which is called the English Ascending Auction. In this auction format, bidders can increase their bid each round. This is a dynamic auction. It's not just a one shot. If bids are not raised anymore, the bidder with the highest bid wins and pays this highest bid. So let's say we have three bidders, A, B and C. They all have their private guesses about how much that object is worth. It might be some common value component like the collector's value. It might be some private taste. B just really likes watches. C is also a fan of watches. A not so much. And they start bidding. A says, okay, I'm bidding five francs. B raises to eight. A raises to nine. C raises to 10. And now A thinks, okay, I think it's only worth 10 francs. I'm not gonna bid higher than that. B uh, raises to 11 and then A thinks, okay, 11 is too much, I'm out. Now C realizes that A is not raising his bid anymore and thinks, hmm, maybe A left at 11 francs, so maybe my guess that it's actually worth 13 francs is wrong. Maybe it's actually worth less because a already left the option. So I'm just not going to bid more. I'm out. And then B has the highest bid with 11 francs and wins. The auction has to pay 11 francs. If that true value, common value was actually 12 francs, then there's also no winner's curse in this setting. And what the work of the Nobel Prize winners showed is that in an ascending auction, Bidders can learn each other's information and bid more confidently. So if they have this dynamic process of observing each other's bids, they learn from each other and that makes them more confident about the actual value of the object. And then they bid more to what their guess, closer to what their guess is about the value. And this was a really important result because you have the, this winner's curse is a problem in many auctions and uh, to just get around this is, a, is, is really important. But now it sounds like the English auction is actually just the best auction out there. It also has some drawbacks like it enables bidders to collude, to uh, kind of communicate with each other, with, with each other uh, throughout the auction and then to collude. So this is not so clear which auction is best. And that's why auction design is actually a tough issue because 
uh, the right choice of auction to sell my watch here in the best way, that's not so easy. And now I just told you what kind of strategic things we think about when we, uh, when we deal with auction theory. But let's see how, where it is applied because now I only showed you the example of this watch. But in, in practice, auctions are really, let me say, everywhere. For example, Google uh, makes a lot of or most of its uh, revenue through advertisements. 2019, that was uh, 134 billion US dollars. And where are those advertisements placed? For example, if you search for something on Google and you just type in some, some word, then often advertisement appears. And every time that you, or most of the times that you look for something on Google, there's an advertisement, there's an auction running in the background because really those companies who want their advertisements to be placed participate in an auction which determines where they are ranked. And those are called ranking auctions. So every time you look for something on Google and there's an advertisement popping up, there was an auction which determined uh, which, which advertisement showed up. Then also the, uh, in auctions in the power grid, getting a supply and demand together in the, in the power grid is not an easy task. And there's a national company in Switzerland which is taking care of that. It's called Swiss Grid. And they auction electricity to neighboring countries because Switzerland often has excess uh, electricity and then they sell it to other countries through auctions. But the government is uh, employing auctions a lot, like, for example, spectrum auctions. You've probably heard of 5G technology. It's, uh, it's the latest thing to have very fast data transfers. And for the use of 5G technology, you actually need to, uh, to send it on some on different frequencies. And those frequencies are owned by the government. And in 2019, the Swiss government sold the use of those frequency bands and made 380 million francs, which were paid by Swisscom Sunrise and Salt. The Swiss market is rather small. In Germany, they made 6.6 .6 billion euros of profit through that. And the government uses auctions all the time. For example, now at this point, uh, the, because of Corona, the government is pumping a lot of money into the economy to help uh, business stay open and so on. And they, they somehow need to get this money from somewhere. So they need to take a loan and they do this through auctioning of government bonds. And then to just uh, get those loans, they use auctions. Also, the European Union is auctioning off their emission certificates and the government is using auctions whenever or many times when they want to have a bridge, highway, railway built. An auction determines who actually gets to build that bridge or that highway and how much is paid. And those are called procurement auctions. And here it's really important to choose the right kind of auction because the government really wants to hand this, uh, this deal to those bidders who actually make the best out of it. So who will best be able to build that highway or to use those frequencies to most effectively use it. And the work of the Nobel Prize winners really helped to make this possible that uh, the government can work much more efficiently. And uh, I just showed you very simple examples so far of how auction theory works and what it deals with, but it gets much more complicated when we talk about multi-object auctions. For example, for those 5G frequency bands, there are many different fre frequencies that can be used and that were sold. So we have multiple things that were up for sale in this auction. And then for bidders, it's really hard to determine how much that's actually worth because uh, it's, it's like 
is, is the 700 megahertz band is it just uh, how much is that worth how much is it worth combined with another one do i need all of them well how much are all of them worth to me how much are only two of them worth to me it gets really complicated and so milgram and wilson got their work also for the invention of new auction formats and that was precisely to also tackle these kinds of issues because those auctions get extremely complex and they came up with smart auction formats which really rely on the theory that I showed you for this, for selling only this watch. But it's really clever and it really helped uh, uh, to raise revenue and to also hand out the objects more efficiently. So let me conclude and tell you that auction theory is part of an area which is called market design. And this really is about whenever we want to set the new the rules for a market how do we proceed well in this example with auctions the government or the auctioneer selects some kind of auction format and then the bidders make their strategic decisions on how much to bid and uh, how much is it worth place their bids and then there's an outcome of the auction but what market design is, uh, and therefore also auction theory is really concerned with is you want to target a, a specific auction outcome. Like really you want to maybe raise revenue if you're Google, or you maybe want to hand the object to the one who makes the best of it and uh, that will benefit society. So you pick some auction outcome, then you anticipate what strategic decisions of people will lead to that auction outcome. And then you think one step back, which auction format will guarantee that uh, bidders make those strategic decisions which lead to the outcome that I want. So this is some kind of reverse engineering and this is studied heavily by economists, computer scientists and engineers. So the work of the Nobel Prize winners really opened up research in many different areas. And if you wanna check out who works on market design and auction theory in Zurich, check out marketdesign.uch.ch. And really one, what I want you to take away today is that the Nobel Prize was awarded to Milgram and Wilson because their work paved the way for the successful use of auctions that improved efficiency in many markets, despite us often not being aware of it. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot, Julian, for this really interesting talk about auctions. Um, this brings us to the end of uh, both of those talks. Um, I'll remind you once more, you still have the chance to ask questions at slide.do by entering code nano-oct. And then in this place, you can also upvote questions you find particularly interesting to make sure they get our attention during the Q&A session. Now, before we switch to the Q&A session, let me just advertise next month's nano talks for a second in november we will cover uh, nobel prizes again once more um, but in november it will be about the nobel prizes in chemistry and physics uh, so more specifically we will be talking about crispr cas and about black holes join us again on november 26 uh, for those nano talks and sign up to the newsletter in the description of the video uh, to make sure you don't miss them but now let's go to the Q&A uh, for today's Nano Talks for Hepatitis C and, uh, and auctions. I have here with me, um, let me quickly adjust this. Uh, so I have Maya and Julian here with me. Um, very nice of both of you to join me today um, for this live Q&A. Um, how are both of you doing? Mic's on. Thanks. <laughs> Good, thank you. So thanks for doing those talks remotely with me. Um, we'll get some audience, audience questions in. We have uh, quite some so far. Um, mm -hmm. I'll start ladies first. Um, Maya, uh, there was a question for you. Um, one of the viewers picked up on, on you mentioning um, that hepatitis C is, or hepatitis is caused by multiple viruses that are somewhat, or that are unrelated or distantly related. Could mm -hmm. you, um, explain us a bit more about this. How comes that multiple viruses cause the same disease? Yes, that's a very, very good question. So 
it is known that there are five different types of hepatitis viruses, but they are actually very different except for causing this same same disease. So for example, the genome types are different. There are DNA and RNA viruses. Some of them replicate in the nucleus of the cell, some in the cytoplasm. So they have different life cycles, but they all seem to like the liver and like to replicate in, in liver cells. And that's why they cause cause the same disease, although they are completely unrelated. And you also mentioned, if I remember correctly, that some viruses that are somewhat closely related to hepatitis C cause um, yellow fever and dengue? Yes, by, by the genome sequence, they are, are clo closely related to hepatitis C or closer relatives than, for example, hepatitis B. So it's not just uh, the family of a virus that is important here, or for once, it's, it's more the nurture part than the nature part here, one could almost say. <laughs> mm, it's, I guess, more like where viruses can replicate or which cells they can, can attack. Okay, that makes sense. Viruses with similar genomes may then still like to go to different types of, of cells. Yeah. Because the genomes are not like identical between different virus species. Cool, thank you, Maya. Um, let's uh, also give Julian a question for the evening. Um, you seem to have explained uh, the different auction formats so well that one of our viewers was saying, well, it seems quite obvious that those are ways you could auction off something. Could you give an example for a new kind of auction format for something like? slightly more complicated maybe or like different from the auctions you introduced yes sure so the auctions i showed you are all for a single single objects so when you uh, sell something like a single watch but it becomes much more complicated when you sell multiple things like those 5g frequencies and there the issue really is that you have a lot of complexity involved because you want to ideally if you want to figure out who do i want to give all those frequencies to you want to know how all the bidders value all the different packages of different frequencies and if you have let's say 20 frequencies and uh, you would like to know all the different combinations of how people value those packages of frequencies like a package could be something like valuing frequency one two and three or valuing frequency five and six, then this uh, becomes really infe unfeasible because uh, it's not possible to ask for all those different combinations of valuations. So you need, uh, so this is a trade-off here and you need to have a simple auction format for this. And what uh, especially I think Milgram uh, worked on was to come up with those uh, auction formats which, which are like a generalization of the uh, ascending auction, which is called the uh, simultaneous ascending auction, where you just bid on different uh, frequencies and raise the bids all the time. So that's uh, just an extension of the single unit auction to a multiple unit auction. But there's also the combinatory clock auction, which is you just pick different bundles as a bidder and then bid on those bundles and uh, and then there's another stage where you actually determine prices of how uh, expensive those um, bundles become. And that's all just to deal with those complexities that when you sell multiple things, uh, you, you cannot simply ask for well, how much is each different uh, bundle worth to you. And if, you, if we're just talking about actually selling your watch that you have here and for which so far we haven't found the buyer, if I'm following the chat correctly, um, then like, are, did you like with the format you covered, like the first and the second, um, how are they called? First and second yeah, level price auction, first, second price auction. And then the English auction, are those the, like the options you would have, or are there other things you would consider if you were to go and actually sell your watch? 
there's also something called the descending auction where you there's a seller who starts at a really at a really high price and then slowly goes down and the first one to say stop wins the auction at that price but that actually turns out to be what's called strategically equivalent to a first price auction so that's there's no real difference to that there okay but uh there's not for the single unit case single ob single object case there's not so much different auction formats out there and which you also see when you bid on ebay or ricardo that's just an ascending auction that you that they employ cool thanks um back to you maya there was uh, another question um you mentioned in the end that only about 15 percent of people are aware that they um or that are aware that they have um, hepatitis c are being treated why is this are drugs very expensive or is this in like depends on where in the world you are or? yes so first of all only 20 percent of those people who have this hepatitis c infection know about the infection and then 15% of those people are treated. And one of the reasons is unfortunately that these new new combination drugs are, are pretty expensive. So not in every country they are available. And there also diagnostics is not, not widely enough available, especially in low and mid income countries there are big issues with both diagnostics and then treatment of hepatitis C. And, and that's one of the reasons why there are still so many, many cases of hepatitis. And do you like see hope for costs coming down there? I mean, those drugs haven't really been invented in 2020. Like at some point their patent protection might expire or something. No, they have been developed during the last 10 years. So they are not that old, okay. but obviously they have to come down if, if that WHO goal is to, is to met by 2030. So that's one of the requirements. Yeah. So do they have a, a strategy of like the WHO of how they want to get those prices down? So it's more broadly affordable. Well, that I don't know about how they how they could get the prices down, but obviously treatment is only one one measures that's going to be done. For example, vaccinations are yeah. also yeah. really important. And if there are enough vaccinations, then obviously treatment is not that necessary because then there are not so many, many cases. and actually in that who goal they want to reduce the number of new infections by 90 percent okay. by 2030 so then also the demand for drugs would be smaller that makes sense um i think there are interesting follow-up questions on uh on the vaccinations there but let's mix it up and go back to some auctions again um there was another viewer question, uh, which was um, for you, Julian, um, is there a concept where personal values affect the winner's curse? For example, if you really want something, you might be willing to pay more than its common value would be and probably wouldn't mind having a bit of a winner's curse. Yes. So this, this question is, of course, a very relevant question and it was also answered by the Nobel Prize winners that you can have a combination of those private values and common values. So, and in many cases, it's actually a fact that the, there is a combination of a common and a private value. So if I bid on that watch, I might think of, well, for how much can I resell it? So that's a, that's a common value. But I also might think of, oh, the, what's my private taste for how often am I going to wear this watch? Yeah. So then the, basically, the stronger this common component, this common value is, the more important it is to let bidders learn from each other uh, in this auction. Because if the common value component is stronger, then uh, it's actually uh, easy that bidders will bid more defensively because they, they are afraid of this winner's curse. 
But then on the other hand, if there's only a private value to the object, then there is basically you know, no winner's curse because you know perfectly how much it's worth to you. So for example, if there were an auction which would sell a dinner with, let's say, Roger, Roger Federer, and there's really not so much of a common component to that. Like You have your private taste for going out with uh, Roger Federer, and then you can just bid whatever you think it's worth, and uh, there's really no winner's curse. So it's uh, there's like a range, uh, okay. private value on this one hand, common value on the other hand, and however strong those two are, uh, that determines a bit how strong this winner's curse can be. And then I assume in like the, the market design, in like how you apply the auctions, people would also be thinking about like these aspects. Exactly. Yes, and that's this is really important because those are exactly the kind of things that market designers take take into account when they think of what kind of auction do I want to use? Because in this frequency auction, well, there's a bit of a private value, but there's also a lot of a common value. So let's take that into account. And that's why a lot of countries use some kind of ascending auction. But then if you would just want to sell that dinner with Roger Federer, you can just go for some other auction format. So we might have a future market designer here um, among our viewers then. Um, <laughs> Really good question. Um, one more question for you, Maya. Um, Leticia, who was watching tonight, um, wanted to know, um, she asked, um, a lot of the research that you um, talked about today was done in the 80s and 90s. Why are Nobel Prizes awarded so many years later? And is this normal? <laughs> mm, well, we have to remember that Okay, I didn't emphasize that maybe enough in, in my talk, but all these three winners, they obviously have been working also during the last 20 years. Especially Charles Rice has done lots of, lots of basic research with hepatitis C virus that has been important, for example, in drug development. But then there are obviously many, many other hepatitis C virus researchers who have, for example, developed a cell culture model, some small animal models that have been like really essential to, to, to start this drug, drug screening. Um, yeah, it's a good question why, <laughs> why it came, came this, this late, but we also have to remember that there is already one Nobel Prize for hepatitis research mm -hmm. in the 70s. Yeah. So maybe they couldn't give another one so I so also have the feeling that the Nobel one. Prize Committee can be quite conservative sometimes to really like they want to see yeah. the impact of research and a lot of basic yeah. research takes some time until it has an impact. So yeah. the year it's published, it might <laughs> not be that clear yet. And then yeah. they wait to see what actually happens with it. And, decide on that and there was or there is this one one scientist who i didn't didn't mention ralph bartenschlager and there was some some discussion why he didn't get or why he wasn't one of these winners well obviously i guess they can give it only to maximum of three people so they they cannot have four four so, joint winners but that seems always yeah. to be a bit of a discussion because clearly science is not just done by three people. And I think another reason why sometimes those prizes are late is that there are a lot of people that do very important <laughs> research and there's only yeah. one Nobel Prize per year. Yeah. Uh, so there's a big scarcity. What I, I, I really like in, in this Nobel Prize is that those scientists, they have mainly done basic research mm -hmm. and that's really important for everybody to, to remember and understand that behind every drug or vaccine we use, there is like years of basic research so that we first learn how, how that virus is behaving, yeah. so that we can then target specific steps of its life cycle. Okay, thanks for answering this. Um, <laughs> Julian, in economics, is, is the discussion similar to like, like how how long it takes uh, between the research and the, the Nobel Prize and why was this person not on the prize or why was, was it that person? 
of course, I, I, I think it might be even stronger in economics because economists are kind of obsessed with prizes and incentives and uh, this prize is really celebrated in the profession. Yeah. So I think it's even uh, too much celebrated. But the, the people who, who worked on this, uh, Milgram and Wilson, who got the, the prize this year, they, I think they worked on, on the stuff in the 70s and 80s. They've done a lot of work since then, of course, but uh, it's, it's been around for a while. And uh, that these new auction formats came into place that was, I think, in the 90s, so okay. also uh, some years ago. Well, then maybe another question for you, Julian. Um, one of the viewers wanted to know, in those auction formats were um, there are multiple bidders and then the question like you showed this one bids this and then another goes up how is it like how's the decision made on who gets to bid first and what happens if all of them send their bid at the same time and they might bid the same value so in this in the first price and the second price auction it's actually said that everyone submits their bid at the same time and then it's re just revealed who bid highest and then in these dynamic auctions, like the ascending auction, there, for example, in this standard format, which you know from uh, your uh, preferred uh, online auction, you can just bid in random uh, in orders however you want. So that's the standard that you just uh, raise one whenever you want, and it, it's not determined who is whose turn is next. And then there are other auction formats where you uh, each round everyone can bid again, and so you bid uh, always at the same time. Okay. Thanks for explaining this. Um, going back to uh, more of a virus question and not just a Nobel Prize question to you, Maya. Um, there mm -hmm. was one question on like, what does it depend on whether there's a possibility to have a vaccine against the disease? And maybe a bit, how do you judge the chances that we, we will have a vaccine for hepatitis C? Mm. Well, obviously, there is ongoing research on, on this issue. And for example, just recently, one, one research group in the US published a paper that seems quite promising. Uh, the method might, might provide a working vaccine against hepatitis C. But the issue with hepatitis C is that it's not only one one virus, but there are actually many different types of hepatitis C viruses as well. Uh. And the virus is very fast replicating and also mutating very fast. So it has been really difficult to develop a vaccine that would then give immunity against all, all hepatitis C viruses. And I guess maybe not enough has been invested in this yeah. vaccine development because when those blood tests came came possible maybe people then thought that okay now it's it is sold yeah <laughs> so if okay. more is invested and maybe one of these newest vaccine candidates might might work okay interesting and maybe on on the same topic a bit on like how to target something. Um, a bit of a different question was, um, why do we need drugs specifically against hepatitis C? Um, hepatitis, hepatitis itself seems to be a liver disease. Why aren't the drugs working for all different kinds of hepatitis? Well, previously, for example, interferons were used to treat hepatitis, but those drugs were not specific to to certain virus or viruses and they had quite bad side effects mm -hmm. so if you design drugs that target like really specific uh, steps of like certain virus then then you can make sure that you really block the virus and don't do any harm to the cell mm -hmm. and then it comes to viruses that they are very diverse and use different mechanisms in their replication and then it comes again to, to the fact that there are these five types of hepatitis viruses. And as I mentioned, some have DNA and some have RNA genomes. So they use different, different mechanisms to, for example, replicate their genomes. 
So that's why, unfortunately, one drug cannot block block a virus that is replicating in the nucleus and another one that is replicating in the cell cytoplasm. Yeah. It seems like virology is a complicated field. <laughs> they are tiny but complicated, <laughs> yes. As we learn again and again in COVID times as well. Um, okay. And maybe um, a question again uh, for Julian uh, that just came in and I find it quite interesting is that um, is there a concept for when an auction makes sense at all and when you shouldn't be using an auction? Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. So um, auctions are great for what's called price discovery. So what you've learned maybe when you took uh, economics in high school is that well, supply and demand will always meet in equilibrium at the equilibrium price. But how you get to this equilibrium price is often a good question. And auctions just help really well to uh, actually to infer what this price will be. And uh, so when I, so we both have an idea about how much uh, the good is worth to us. And then we use an, au an auction to make actually this trade. And auctions have proven to be extremely successful to help just make uh, the economic process more efficient and uh, to just help in this price discovery. But of course, auctions are not, uh, cannot be employed uh, all the time. So for example, there are settings where uh, you cannot transfer any money and auctions really rely on this fact that the information that you extract from people, how much it's worth to them is really through this uh, this payment. So it's really important that you have a mon monetary transfer. But then, for example, if uh, someone's donating a kidney, yeah. in, if due to ethical and, and many other reasons, you can't really charge them, charge money for for this um, for this transplant. And uh, then it's another question of who needs this kidney most and who can we allocate this to. And this is another area of market design, which is called uh, matching. And this has also been awarded a Nobel Prize three years ago because it, because it's really uh, important. And there, it's really about monetary transfers are not possible. So how do we get around this? And then maybe from uh, from the same viewer from Pascal, a follow up question to this is um, why, like for things in public interest like five G frequencies, why are we doing like giving them away via auctions and not via a matching system? Why don't we just uh, so, give them to the company that uh, could provide best coverage or something? Uh, but then it's really just a beauty contest. It's like uh, you just have to make the nicest presentation that you will provide the best service. And uh, this is really an issue because this, this is basically how it was done before, that it was done through lobbying. Sometimes it was just, was just randomly allocated. And uh, the auction is so powerful because it helps us to really find out who will do the best service because they are the, the ones who are willing to pay the most for it. And that's why auctions are so powerful here. And just, uh, just uh, getting this, um, it's, it's just kind of cheap talk to just try to convince someone I'm going to provide the best service. This is hard to figure out. And the auction really helps in this. So then the government uses auctions to figure out how valuable a certain frequency would actually be to a provider and like, exactly, optimally yes. speaking, distribute them as good as possible. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And the government has the, has the incentive. They want to give it to the one who will provide the best service actually. And of course they also want to make some revenue, but uh, the overall um, objective is to really just to give it to those who, who will make the best of it and uh, the auctions help in that. Cool. Um, so there, there are more questions, but I think it is time that we wrap this, like start to wrap this evening up. Um, and I have a wrap up question that I always like to ask at the end of the nano talks to both speakers. Um, actually, I, uh, well, I had two very interesting wrap up questions. Um, you can answer one of them. Um, the first one was given by a viewer last time, um, which is, what got you interested in your topic um, at first and why is it such an interesting topic? Um, and the second one um, is, do you have anything you want the viewers to know about? 
anything you want to pitch that you're doing that they should follow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maya, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer the first first yeah. question first. So I have always been fascinated about microbiology and especially viruses, how how small and smart they they are. And well, although currently I'm studying very different types of viruses, I, I used to study a virus that is similar to hepatitis C, C virus and, and replicates in the same same way. So okay. that that kindly makes... led me to this subject. <laughs> cool. And to give you time to think about the second part, Julian, what, what got you into, into auctions? <laughs> so I am personally not uh, specifically working on auctions, but more on uh, market design questions. But I always like to think about how people interact strategically and how you can model that with mathematics. And that led me into an area which is called game theory. And I studied that a lot during my undergrad. And then during my PhD, I learned about market design, which is basically this one level above game theory that you uh, see that you, that you take into account how people interact strategically and use this information to define the rules for a market. And uh, this is how I ended up in market design. Cool. And then does any of you have anything they want to pitch? Well, if you are interested in market design, there are many cool blogs by economists out there. Um, just, just, uh, but not, nothing specific they would like to pitch. So then maybe Maya, something that you want to pitch? Or? Well, I guess we already have covered the most important topics and everybody now knows more about viruses because of this COVID <laughs> pandemic. So, okay. Then maybe I will just pitch um, for the end um, that uh, in a month from now, the next Donut Talks will take place. Uh, that will be on uh, Thursday, November 26th. And it will be about the uh, Chemistry Nobel Prize and the Physics Nobel Prize. Uh, sign up to our newsletter uh, to make sure that you don't miss them. And join us again for the next live stream. And with that, with that, I would like to thank both of you again for uh, taking your time, preparing your presentation, recording them, joining me now for this live Q&A with the audience. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Um, I hope both of you have a nice evening and I hope everyone is staying safe. <laughs> thank you so much. This was great. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Joel, and stay safe. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Okay, stream's gone. You can actually like